If you would please grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth in chapter 4. That's the eighth book in your Bible going forward from Genesis. It's right between Judges and 1 Samuel. And again, I'd just like to say for those maybe who were not in, in this room when we began, it's great to have you this morning, especially if you're visiting. If you are visiting, we have little cards in the pews in front of you if you'd like to fill one out so we can keep in contact with you. It'd be great to do that. We will not sell your information. We will not harass you or chase you down or anything like that. We just want to thank you for coming and being with us. So we're on the last of this series of the book of Ruth, and we've been going through this the last few weeks, and I hope you've been as blessed as the, the rest of us have been with watching Ruth's journey and all the incredible applications that come to it for our lives today. And it's in these weeks we've followed it from this very bitter beginning filled with loss, pain, and poverty and ruin to where we are this morning. We saw Naomi leave with her family to the land of Moab and come back with nothing. She went away full and returned empty, as the scripture says. We saw how in their poverty, God was true to his word and provided food for them and protection under the guard of Boaz, a man who, as it so happened, might hold the key to reversing their misfortune. We learned about Ruth's faithfulness and how that is a reflection of God's faithfulness to his people in times when they're struggling. And last week, Richard led us through the matchmaking scheme, I mean, clever planning that uh, Naomi had for Ruth to approach Boaz by night on the threshing floor, asking for his protection and his hand in marriage. Now, Boaz accepted, but there was one small monkey wrench in that plan. It was not that, it's that he was not the first in line to have the right to inheritance of Elimelech. So he does the honorable thing and pled his case before the city elders. And the other man initially accepted until he read the fine print and found out that a Moabite wife was attached to the land. And he reconsidered. So where we are this morning is Boaz has redeemed Ruth. Now, that would seem almost enough, a good place to stop the story. We already have a nice happy ending with a nice bow tied around it, but the story keeps going. It leads us a little bit further. Now, why is that? Well, because we need to see that it's not just a matter of Boaz redeeming Ruth, but God, through ordinary workings of ordinary people, is redeeming Naomi. So this morning, we're going to see three things that God restored to Naomi, bringing her out of ruin to redemption. The first thing we see is that through Boaz, God redeemed land. Backtracking a little bit into last week, what Richard was talking about, the main issue with this redemption was not necessarily to do with Ruth and Naomi. Now, this is an old uh, ancient world legal practice, so just bear with us. But it's through the certainty that the main aspect of the writer intended for us to get that legally this issue revolved around the land. In the Old Testament, land was everything. You know, in our day, real estate is a business. We buy and sell when we need it as an asset to liquidate. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't so much a business as it was just a way to live. This was an agrarian society that relied on farming and livestock. It's how you fed your family. It's how you made a living. And you needed land to do that. And this land was family owned. It was separated out by tribe and clan. This was handed down to the children of Israel from when they came into the promised land. God promised them a fruitful land where they could make a great life for themselves and their family. And he promised to keep it to them as long as they continued in covenant with him. The Lord also put certain protections in place to keep the land in families. This was much like the way we had the law of gleaning in chapter 2 where God shows his heart to the poor and those who fall in hard times. The law in, of the land is in reference to the jubilee when all was returned and debts were released. If a family had to sell their land to another family to make ends meet, during, well, during the jubilee, that land would be returned to the family owner. But... Another way this could work is it with a kinsman redeemer 
who could take back the land. This person would act on behalf of the one who's destitute or unable to bring the land back into the family. This is all in Leviticus chapter 5, if you want to search that out for yourself. Uh, But if the other kinsman had redeemed the land, not Boaz, this land would go to his descendants. So he initially agreed, this is a great deal. He's about to build some wealth. And it would have stayed there because they were of the same clan. But where would that leave Naomi and Ruth? Well, that's, that's the question. So in restoring the land to the family of Naomi, they're restoring the family standing, their reputation. Elimelech, as we saw in chapter one, was a man of status in Bethlehem. And when they left for Moab, it seemed as if the hand of the Lord moved very strongly against him and he lost all of his standing. And by default, Naomi lost all of her standing. And Naomi, through bereavement, three times has fallen from standing. She's landed at the bottom with her daughter-in-law, left to glean for scraps just to keep going. But through Boaz, God has restored Naomi's standing by returning to that family, the land that belonged to them. Well, it's kind of difficult maybe to find a modern equivalent to this. Maybe we can look at it this way. Have you ever found yourself in a really dark, tight spot? And maybe wondered how you got there. Maybe it's relationally, maybe it's financially, maybe it's spiritually or emotionally. But you feel out of place. Like you wandered out of where you really should be and you're somewhere else and you don't know and your standing is gone. But, and you want to turn around, but you don't know how. Well, God can restore you, even when you're cast down. Do you know that scripture? It says, the steps of a man, which it applies to everybody, are ordered by the Lord. Though he stumble, he shall not be utterly cast down, because the Lord upholds his hand. Even when you fall down, you won't be thrown into darkness. That's a time to wait on the Lord to reach down. And lift you back up. Because in him there's a secure place to stand. So God redeemed this land for them. And he gave them their standing back. And through Boaz he also restored the second thing. Their lineage. The story we pick back up in verse 13. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. The narrator doesn't want to seem to waste any time. He spent a lot of time on that legal thing in chapter 4. Now he wants to hurry us along from that scene to where the conclusion that we've all been waiting for these last couple of chapters. We've watched this budding relationship grow between them. And now we see them brought together. Boaz is no longer ruthless. I am fully aware of how bad that is. He took her in marriage. He brought her to him. And they did as married couples do. And then this remarkable thing happened. They're getting a honeymoon baby. It says the Lord gave her conception. Oh, now we thought we had a happy ending before. We've got a really happy ending now, don't we? But the author, you'll notice, he wants to make a point here. Notice the way he phrased that. This child had been directly given to them by the Lord. Now, we see this language in other parts of the Bible. If you go back to Genesis, you have Leah and Rachel with Jacob. And then if you go a little further past Ruth, you have the first chapter of the book of 1 Samuel where the Lord gave conception, where this idea that children, the giving of children is in the sovereign hands of the Lord. And we all heard it said, maybe maybe you have, uh, that it's practically a miracle that any woman gets pregnant. Because everything has to be timed so perfectly. All of these significant factors all have to fall into place and come together for that little life before, to form. And in our day, when we're gifted with so much knowledge of how all this works, of how human reproductive system operates, we're we're maybe a little too clinical when we think about it. Maybe somehow we forgot to see how miraculous 
this occurrence is because nothing can prepare you for the moment when you first see that little blob on the screen and hear that heartbeat for the first time. It's in that moment that you know this is a gift from God. And in our overly clinical society as evangelical Christians, we stand for the rights of the unborn. But sometimes even we can lose sight of the hand of God that knits those parts together. And to further this miraculous thing, for Ruth, this was the first time she was experiencing this. She was married for 10 years to Elimelech's son, yet she never had a child. When her husband died and she left with Naomi to be an outsider in a strange land, it can be reasonably assumed that she probably never expected to have children of her own because she was a Moabite. She didn't belong with the Israelites. And anyone who's walked down that long road of trying to have children and unable to and finding themselves disappointed time after time, we understand, they can understand how she may have felt. But here, God in his goodness gave her a child. He restored their lineage. And this is a miraculous thing. This is cause for celebration. It even says, it continues in the next verse, it says, the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel for he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Now, the women of the neighborhood, these are probably the same ones who watched Naomi return, and they said to one another, is this Naomi? As they watched this impoverished woman walk back into town, now they praise God as they watch her restoration. Naomi, in her joy, takes this child, places it on her lap, and she becomes his nurse, or as one commentator put it, basically, his foster mother. She who had returned to Bethlehem with emptiness has now received fullness in return. As if to contrast with her lament in chapter one at the loss of her sons, she says this thing. She says a son is, they say a son is born to Naomi where she had said to Ruth and Orpah on that road to Judah, I cannot give you any more sons. Now she has been given a son, an heir, someone who will carry the standing, the lost legacy of Elimelech to care for the land, to care for the family. And this is so important in the ancient world for an heir to be established. And in this turn of events, these women uh, gave him a name, which, by the way, is not something you normally want to do with a pregnant woman. But they did anyway. They named him Obed, which means one who serves. Now, some say this may be a shortening of Obadiah, which means the servant of Yahweh, which is a very interesting thought, but I couldn't really find anything conclusive on that. But it's a good thought. And it's through Obed that we see how God has restored that one final thing. He's restored their legacy. In verse 17, going down there, it says, they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, the writer puts this phrase in there because when they were writing this down, the story had been filled in. This is, the, this is where he's been leading us this entire time. This story uh, it has been told orally for years and years of God's great faithfulness to Naomi and to Ruth, the story of God's provision in giving this a son, them a son. And all this time later, when the Holy Spirit moved on this author to write this story down, he showed them that this does not only tell us of God's faithfulness to Naomi, but also God's faithfulness to Israel. In the, his people, in the time of the judges, everyone was doing everything, what was, whatever was right in their own eyes. They deemed uh, this to be a time when they could have carte blanche with whatever they wanted to do. It was a time of war and greed and immorality. And when the culture and the leadership defied God, 
But he was still moving among his people. He was still working in the ordinary lives of men and women to bring about their good. In this case, it was the line of David, the greatest king that Israel would ever know. That is a legacy. But in Christian hindsight, we remember something else, don't we? We look back to the story and we remember that this is evidence of God's hand throughout all of history because it's out of this line that God will bring not just the king of Israel but the king of all creation because out of this stump of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, a shoot shall come forth from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of of the Lord. This is the legacy of Obed, the legacy of Ruth, that God in his providence took a Moabite, the last person you'd expect outside of Israel, and from her womb began the line that would be bring about the birth of the Messiah the descendant who would not just take a small portion of land and keep it in the family, but through his life, death, burial, and descent to the dead, ascension and resurrection power to the right hand of God would show himself to be the rightful owner and ruler of all earth and heaven with a lineage, a kingdom of priests that will reign with him forever. That is the legacy that God gave them. If ever there was a place where we could quote that verse in a cliche way, all things work together for good, it's right here. These two women, in a matter of months, went from nothing to birthing the line of kings. Out of all that heartache, all of that sorrow, all of that pain, God brought about the ultimate good, and he didn't do it in an obvious way. There was no message from heaven. There was no angel sent to appear to them. There was no prophet who wandered into the village. There was no sign given to them. God used ordinary people in ordinary ways to lead his people out of their darkness and into the light. Can I say that this should be a comfort for us today, shouldn't it? Isn't it great to think that God doesn't only use amazing and outstanding people but he can use just ordinary average people like us to accomplish his purposes. Isn't it great to think that he doesn't need a fanfare and smoke and lights to let us see that he's on the move, but he uses stories like these to show us that he is always working even when we can't see it. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe he's moving here today? Do you believe he's in the room with us today? We say it every week at the Eucharistic prayer. We say the Lord is here, but do we really believe it? Or maybe are we too enamored with the big things that we miss how God moves in the small things in the ordinary? Is that maybe a struggle for you, though, because of the trial you're in? Maybe, maybe it's that diagnosis. Maybe because of the waiting, because of the loss. You can't see the light. You can't see the good in this situation. Maybe you're in a period of struggle mentally or emotionally, fighting against the dark. Maybe you have a loved one who's sick and needs help. Maybe your financial situation is grim. And in that darkness, you can easily lament with Naomi at the beginning of the story. That's easy enough. But you're still struggling to rejoice with her at the end of the story. Well, if that's you, you can count on this one thing. God is still good. He is still faithful. He's still moving, especially in your brokenness. Out of the deepest sorrow, God can bring about unspeakably good things. He could do it for Naomi, and he can still do it for you. God's heart is not against you, even when it seems like his hand is. If you are in Jesus Christ, you have standing with God. It just happens to be in a particular place right behind that cross. Because what Christ accomplished, God's heart 
uh, because of what Christ accomplished, God's heart is ever bent in your direction, ever seeking your good, ever intending only what is best for you. You can trust him. And this is a word for you this morning if you're in that place. If God can take Naomi, bitter and broken, and lift her out, and put her crumbling family into the lineage of Jesus, then how can we doubt that he will not do good things for us? Sure, it, it probably will look a little different. It may even look as if it's not happening. It may even feel like you're going backwards instead of forward. But remember that God moves in the most unlikely ways to bring about the greatest good. He will bring about good out of your suffering. It's not in vain. You're being shaped, molded. Your path is being formed. And though you may stumble, you will not be cast headlong because he's got you in his hand. And he will restore you. He will redeem your brokenness and use it to show his glory. Christ Church, this is a word for us as well. I've only been here nine years. Some of you guys have been here longer. But just in that period of time, we've seen some tough spots, haven't we? Been in a few. We've been backed into a few corners. We've had some losses. We've had our share of grief. And it may be so easy to look back on the past and the rich history that this church has and feel as if something's been lost. But you do not need to keep looking back. God is not through yet. He is moving and he's working even in those ordinary days, those ordinary ways to bring us to where we need to be, to work all of these things for our good. In our testing, we're made stronger. And in our waiting, will we be found faithful? Will we see our chapter four? Will we look back at this, these losses in hindsight? Will generations look backwards in hindsight and see the legacy of God's goodness and faithfulness to us? Because our story is not over yet. The best is still ahead of us. Do you agree? Maybe? Okay, some of you look a little skeptical. <laughs> God loves to use ordinary people to do great things. We've been talking about this revival at Asbury that's been going on, which, by the way, isn't it interesting that at this predominantly United Methodist school, when the United Methodist Church nationwide is going the way of the Episcopal Church, that God is doing a revival among those students, that God is saying, I'm not through with you guys yet. Isn't that amazing? But you know, this started at an ordinary chapel service in an ordinary way, and God just showed up. It doesn't have to be smoke and lights. It doesn't have to be the perfect experience. God loves to take broken people and broken situations and make them new. So I've got to ask, will you let him do that for you today? Will you come to him in faith and cast all of that doubt, all of those sorrows, all of that uncertainty, that pain, all the dying hope at his feet? Because his offer is open to all who will come and give it over to him. Only God can bring redemption from ruin. And he's never stopped doing that. So let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness to Naomi.